Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our discussion on Ukraine with General Ben Hodges. I am Jim Hake, the founder and CEO at Spirit of America, and I'm delighted to see so many of our supporters on the call today and members of our directors and board of advisors. I want to thank you all for your support. Uh, we, we couldn't be doing anything, uh, what we're doing in Ukraine or elsewhere without you. Uh, for those who don't know, Spirit of America is a privately funded 501c3 nonprofit. This is our 20th anniversary, and for 20 years, we have worked alongside U.S. troops and diplomats all over the world to provide private assistance to help them defend freedom, strengthen the front lines of democracy. And we provide private assistance to fill the gaps between what needs to be done and what government can do. We are the only nonprofit that has an agreement with the Department of Defense that allows the US military to work with us to identify needs, receive and distribute assistance, and provide logist logistical support. Uh, we're the only one. And we've been active in Ukraine since 2014. Since Russia's full-scale invasion last year, we have raised $66 million in private donations and worked with our US military partners to provide non-lethal assistance to Ukrainian soldiers to help Ukraine win and to help them stop the suffering at its source. And the source of that suffering in Ukraine is, is the Russian Federation. So a housekeeping question uh, is, if you have questions today, please use the Q&A uh, function on your Zoom toolbar. I'll moderate with General Hodges. Uh, so now I'm, I'm very happy to introduce uh, General Ben Hodges. General Hodges is a graduate of the US Military Academy. He is the former commanding general of US Army Europe, which is where we first met back in 2015. And he uh, serves now as senior advisor to Human Rights First. He is also an absolutely invaluable member of Spirit of America's Board of Advisors. So General Hodges, thank you for that. And thank you for being with us today. Jim, thank you for the privilege uh, and the privilege of everyone's time to, to talk about some things that are that are so important for all of us. But I, I do remember when we first met and what Spirit of America, I saw you in action, your team in action, helping us in Moldova, in Ukraine, uh, in Romania and other places. So I'm very proud to be a part of Spirit of America. Well, and it, thanks again for being with us all today. Uh, so if we could start off with your take on where does the war stand today. Uh, what are the latest developments that you think people ought to know about, please? So, of course, um, Ukraine is in a, is a in a fight for its existence, and uh, it's a very, very difficult fight. Um, I think uh, we may have missed the chance to, to finish this thing earlier because of uh, a lack of commitment on the part of the West to actually help Ukraine win. What's been provided is significant. It's helped Ukraine stay in the fight, but we haven't committed to Ukraine actually winning. And so when you don't have a clearly defined objective, you don't, it's hard to have good policy. And so this has resulted in, uh, I think, very incremental decision-making uh, and the delivery of important capabilities way later than they, they should have been. Nonetheless, uh, there's no reason that we can't correct that uh, in stride and, and make the decision, make the commitment that is in our interest that Ukraine actually wins, that Russia is defeated and ejected back to the 1991 borders. What, what does that mean? That means we have to give them the capabilities, and there's a lot of different weapons and platforms that can give them the capability to, uh, first of all, make Crimea untenable. That's the key. Crimea is the decisive terrain of this war. Ukraine knows they'll never be safe or secure as long as Russia occupies Crimea. And maybe more significantly, they'll never be able to rebuild their economy. People are not going to invest in Ukraine as long as it looks like the war could pick back up again. And that's exactly what Russia will be able to do if they occupy Crimea. Uh, all of their ports would be blocked. So um, I think giving them the ability to make Crimea untenable is the key. And they've already proven the concept uh, with just three storm shadow cruise missiles provided by UK. Uh, I think all the listeners would have uh, would be aware that Ukraine was able to hit the Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Sevastopol, destroy the headquarters, and also severely damage the dry dock there, uh, along with destroying two ships that were in the dry dock. 
and the Black Sea Fleet has begun to reposition away from Sevastopol further to the east. So that proves the concept with some long range precision capability, we can make Crimea untenable. And that's, to me, that is what will really change things. On the ground, uh, of course, the uh, Ukrainians are, are having to fight against uh, very, very strong uh, Russian defenses, these uh, minefields, and uh, we have not yet given them adequate breaching capabilities. And of course, as we all know, we would never send American soldiers to do this without having achieved total air superiority. And yet somehow we expected Ukraine to be able to do that. So I think Ukrainians are adapting, um, but this, this is not gonna rapidly improve until we, the West, decide and recognize it's in our interest and then provide the Ukrainians what they need to achieve that sort of decisive outcome. Could you say a little bit more about why making Crimea untenable for the Russians is so important for liberating uh, all of Ukraine? So um, Crimea, of course, uh, it's, it's almost exactly the same size as the state of Massachusetts uh, and where it sits on the map. Uh, it's the reason that Catherine the Great first annexed Crimea back at the end of the 18th century. It, it gives its owner the ability to dominate much of the Black Sea. And so on the Crimean Peninsula, the Russians have their uh, main Navy base at Sevastopol on the west side. And then there's uh, there are several air bases. The biggest one is a place called Saki, S-A-K-Y, on the west side of Crimea. And then on the northern part of Crimea is a very large logistics hub called Zhankoi. If the Ukrainians had the ability to hit all three of those, plus other bases that they know about, then the Russian Navy would have to complete withdrawal from Crimea. Uh, they could not provide logistical support to their defense, to their defenders in the southern part uh, along the Dnipro River uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and Russian air forces and drones could not be launched from there. So uh, making it untenable is the first step towards its liberation. And what do you think the West needs to do to help Ukraine do that? Now, you've talked a, a lot about uh, attackums in the past. Those have been provided to, to some degree. Could you say a little bit more about what support Ukraine needs and what, again, the attackums, for example, have uh, helped accomplish? So um, if you think about uh, the 300-kilometer uh, range attackums, uh, or the German Taurus, which is uh, another cruise missile, very effective, has a range of almost 500 kilometers, that's 300 miles. Uh, every single bit of Russian-occupied Ukraine could be hit with precision. Uh, General Kavoli, the Sakyur, uh, I listened to him speak uh, a while back, and he said, of course, the only advantage the Russians have is mass, and you can counter or uh, neutralize that advantage of mass with precision, as long as you have enough time and enough precision weapons. And that means going after headquarters, going after artillery, and going after logistics. If you can eliminate those three, then it doesn't matter how many troops the Russians uh, continue to bring forward to push into this meat grinder. It's the headquarters, the artillery, and the logistics. So providing long-range precision strike capability to Ukraine would enable them to neutralize the only advantage the Russians have while also making Crimea untenable. So we're talking about, um, I don't want to focus on specific platforms, uh, but capabilities like what ATACMS brings, and I'm talking about the unitary warhead. What we did provide was about 20 or 25 ATACMS that have a much shorter range, and they carry the cluster munition. Now, this is good because the Ukrainians immediately put them to work and destroyed 20, 20, of these uh, Russian uh, uh, attack helicopters that were so devastating during the initial uh, stages of Ukraine's ground, ground attack. Uh, so they've already had to move those further back, but that particular ATACMS does not work against uh, Sevastopol, for example, and they don't have the range to hit all the places in Crimea that are necessary. Um, I do believe that we're gonna see finally the uh, ground launch small diameter bomb, which has 150 kilometer range uh, precision weapon that's going to finally arrive in January. Um, so these will all help, but it's not going to be the quantity or the range to have the decisive effect 
uh, that Ukraine needs. Uh, so I, I want to ask you in a moment about uh, General Zeluzhny's recent comments on what is needed to have a breakthrough and win. But the with, with the proper support, your view is that Ukraine can win. Absolutely. There, there's no doubt. I mean, we, we know from history that war is a test of will and it's a test of logistics. Ukraine's logistics situation continues to get better, but they've got 50 countries uh, that are continuing to provide capabilities to Ukraine. Uh, the combined contributions of Europe, by the way, has surpassed that of the United States. So it's not just the U.S. And then and most of what we're providing, of course, is uh, are things that are manufactured in the United States. And then the equipment is handed over to the Ukrainians. There's not pallets of money, which I think some people think is, is what's happening. That's, that's not the case at all. Um, the test of will, it, it's obvious that Russian soldiers and Russian people do not have the same will as do the Ukrainian troops and the civilian population who are defending their country uh, in an existential fight. Uh, I would hate to be a Russian private sitting in a trench this winter. They have a terrible logistic system. They don't have leadership that cares about them. So uh, I anticipate Ukraine will maintain the pressure on the Russians. The, the, the big test of will, though, of course, is between the Kremlin and Western capitals, Washington, Berlin, Paris, London, and, and others. Uh, I think that for the, for the Russians, their only hope, their only hope is that we will uh, lose interest. And, and so every time I see a headline where one of the geniuses here in Washington or other places talks about it's time for a settlement. You know, we've there's no way Ukraine can win. We need to settle now. That's just oxygen to Russia to keep going uh, because that's what they're counting on is for us to lose the will to continue supporting. And um, I, I think uh, Ukrainians have proven that they just need the tools. They're not asking for any troops. They just need the tools. Uh, and then we all benefit from it. Well, let's take a step back and, and what's your take, what's your uh, explanation to folks about why it matters that Ukraine win? Thank you for asking that, because I think this is um, goes to the core of, of getting them the help they need. I think most Americans, if they hear why this is important, then it's like, OK, I mean, this, let's do this, because this is not like it's a choice. Should we send things to Ukraine or should we put money on our border or whatever? These are these are not uh, disconnected from each other. This is about America's security as well as our economy. When you think about what has happened since Russia attacked Ukraine first in 2014 and then in the large scale invasion back February last year, uh, how this has affected uh, the flow of grain which jacks up food prices around the world. Not just This is not just about reducing grain available for people in Africa and the Middle East. This has affected food prices around the world, including ours. So that, that affects us. The disruption of energy, uh, millions of refugees now um, across Europe, all of these things hurt America's economy because our economy depends on European prosperity and European prosperity depends on stability and security in Europe. So there's a direct economic impact for us, um, a benefit when Ukraine defeats Russia. Secondly, the Russians have made it clear that they're not going to stop. I mean, they talk openly all the time that when they're done with Ukraine, then they're going to Baltic countries or Poland. I mean, they openly talk about this. Well, what does that mean for us? That means NATO then is going to be in a war, which means you're going to have American troops involved. We're going to actually be in a direct conflict with a nuclear power, Russia, if they are not stopped fighting against Ukraine. Third thing, you think about uh, what's happening now, our number one uh, enemy for decades, the, the one country that talks all the time about uh, their nuclear weapons and their ability to destroy the United States, they are an existential threat to the US. Ukraine is wrecking Ukraine, Russia's military, they're wrecking Russia's uh, defense industry, and not one American soldier has even broken a fingernail in the process. So this is for uh, a very, very small investment. Ukraine is doing what NATO was designed to do 75 years ago, which is to stop Russia. And then you have to think about 
um, some of the intangible things. We, we call it, we refer to it as the rules-based international order that was created mainly by the United States and UK in the aftermath of World War II and from which we have all prospered. Respect for sovereignty, respect for international agreements, respect for freedom of navigation, respect for human rights. All of these things are at stake now. And if we're not willing to help Ukraine uh, defeat Russia, which is which has no respect for sovereignty, no respect for freedom of navigation and all the others, and certainly they've never lived up to any agreement they've ever made, then this is only going to get worse. And the Chinese are watching this very closely. The Chinese are looking to see, are we serious when we talk about Taiwan or the South China Sea and international agreements and respect for human rights? And I think the, the Chinese are watching very closely to see, does the United States, with our allies, do we have the political will, the industrial capacity, and the military capability to actually defend those uh, intangible things, to help Ukraine defeat Russia, to help Israel defeat Hamas, and still be able to push Israel towards a, uh, a peaceful solution in the Middle East and deter Iran from escalation and still be able to look the Chinese in the eye and say, do not make a terrible miscalculation. That's what's at stake here. If we fail in Ukraine, then I think the chances of things getting much worse uh, will go up significantly. Well, it, it seems... Well, you're familiar with uh, what Spirit of America is doing, not only in Ukraine, but around the world in Eastern Europe, uh, West Africa, the Middle East, uh, Asia Pacific region. And Russia is behind every bad thing, that, just about every bad thing that's happening in the world today. Uh, allies with Iran, Russia, you know, supporting Hamas, Russia, destabilizing Western Africa, destabilizing democracies in Europe. It's all about Russia. So one of the things you brought up uh, World War II and what the prosperity and stability that came after World War II, after America and our allies won World War II. One of the things that I, I've been talking a little about with people, and I want to get your feedback on this, General, is uh, when you look at what's at stake in Ukraine today, it's a good question to ask, what would the world be like today if we had lost World War II? And that is, in, in my view, in our view, Really, what? Well, we certainly would not be enjoying the prosperity, right? And it's you know, what kind of world are our children going to live in? Because the kind of world we would live in, would have lived in after World War II, if we had lost, is what the future holds if Russia wins in Ukraine. So it's not going to stop in Ukraine. Well, is that overly dramatic? Do you think? No, I, I don't think it's overly dramatic. Uh, we would certainly not be enjoying the prosperity that we have now. Uh, this. Uh, international rules-based uh, order, which sounds like a social scientist kind of gobbledygook, but if you unpack what it means, it's what we it has benefited all of us more than anyone else in the world. Uh, but that was not cheap, and and it's not something to be taken for granted. Uh, this war in Ukraine right now is the result of failed deterrence. We did not act after Russia invaded Georgia, after they jumped over President Obama's red line in Syria. Uh, we didn't really react after they invaded Ukraine in 2014. Um, and then they see that, you know, we were um, the chaos inside the United States after the last election. Uh, NATO didn't look like it was ready. So the Russians felt like they could uh, go ahead and finish the job in Ukraine. That, that's why it's important that we help Ukraine win now. We, we could fix European security for generations if Russia is actually defeated. So Ukraine winning is part of it. Russia has to be defeated also. Well, let me get to a few of the, thank you. Let me get to a few of the questions that have come in from uh, some of the folks that are participating here. How effective are Ukraine's psych psychological operations? So uh, Ukrainians, I think we're gonna be studying them for years of how they manage to, uh, uh, get the narrative of, of uh, almost a, a, a sense of inevitability that they're going to win. I believe it, but they were able to uh, get the respect of most of the world with how they have 
stood up to Russia, uh, how they have earned this reputation for being so innovative and uh, that they are, they are proving that war is a test of will. And so I, I think a lot of this is how they have been very clever. Um, uh, they're the most tech savvy um, soldiers I ever met from any country. And, and they have managed to do things that uh, have, have helped balance out the huge advantages that Russia brought to the fight. And what do you think of using Russian government assets in the West to fund more arms to Ukraine? Yeah, this this is a no brainer. You know, I'm from Florida, and the state of Florida use uh, captured uh, when law enforcement captures drug boats and and uh, all these kind of things, and they sell them off, and it's used to help fund for counter narcotic efforts by Florida state uh, uh, law enforcement efforts. This, this is what we should be doing, that, that um, Russian assets. Now, there's a reason we haven't already done it, of course. There, there are some uh, issues with it. Uh, our, our government will be worried a little bit about precedent. Uh, what does that mean? So it's not that simple, but it does seem like a no-brainer um, when we're uh, the, you've got Russians with enormous wealth that are, have somehow been protected. You've still got Russians that own property in the West, including in the United States or going to school there. Um, so I think until the oligarchs start personally feeling it, I mean, feeling it in a big way, uh, then Putin is not gonna feel much pressure to, to change his attitude. And back to General Zeluzhny's assessment of what Ukraine needs to have, have the breakthroughs it needs. Uh, he's calling for rapid innovation in some key areas, including electronic warfare, uh, mind breaching technology, and, and so on. So it, it, government is generally not good at rapid innovation and rapid deployment of the kind that Ukraine needs in terms of these new technologies and systems. Is there a role for the private sector to play in helping in this innovation space that you, uh, Ukraine needs so desperately? I think it's essential. Uh, we we should be studying how the Ukrainians why why are they able to do things so so much more quickly than we do? Well, obviously they're in a war fighting for survival, and so all the normal procedures and things in many cases have gone out the window. Uh, in the U.S., we have plenty of really smart, hardworking people, but you've got um, a lot of bureaucracy, and and I don't mean that in the negative sense, bureaucracy, but there are a lot of things that you have to go through that are put in place by the Congress, uh, by different administrations to protect the taxpayer dollars. Uh, and, and there's a whole other, lot of other reasons why you have certain procedures in place. So uh, to do this, the, the Congress would have to play, I think, an important role to, to remove some of the risk uh, to, to incentivize innovation and for us to be willing to test and do things uh, in combat that are not perhaps yet ready, but yet there's no better place to test them than in combat, which is what the uh, Ukrainians are doing. Another question from uh, one of our participants. Uh, how is the Polish trucker blockade affecting weapons delivery? Yeah, this, this is a, uh, a concern, not just because of uh, maybe what, what's happening with the disruption of delivery, uh, but the fact is, Poland plays such a key role. I mean, they bore the brunt in the early days of refugees. Poland carried a huge load for all of us. And obviously now it's the portal through which they're at Zhezhov, where all of the aid is passing to get into Ukraine. So this, this trucker uh, strike, though, it's a, it's a reality of the situation. And of course, the Russians will, will exploit these kinds of things. Um, the uh, because Ukraine, because the European Union has made it possible, and I think it was a good policy decision for Ukraine to do things inside the EU, almost as if they were a member of the EU, um, they actually have an unfair competitive advantage in terms of truckers, the numbers of truck drivers, and uh, the lower cost of Ukrainian trucking, it hurts Polish trucking industry. So. Um, this is something that uh, I think the previous or the outgoing Polish government could have done a better job of, uh, but they were in the middle of their own election campaign. So this this is part of the uh, part of the fabric 
of what's going on um, is that you've got old uh, frictions, if you will, as well as this basic economic competition uh, between Poland and Ukraine. And we have a question from one of our, uh, one of your fellows, Spirit America Board of Advisors members, uh, another uh, general officer, who says he's heard a report of Ukrainian general officer leadership that it's time to look for a negotiated settlement. And the question is, was that just Russian disinformation? Yeah, I, I can't imagine that any uh, Ukrainian general officer uh, would actually say that. I, I think uh, there may be some that think it, but I think they all know uh, what comes next. So I, 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 I can't say that, that that never happened, but it's hard to imagine that anybody in, uh, in the general staff um, or in the president's office would actually say that um, or, or want, to, want to go that direction. I, I think they've got too much invested. Now, to be fair, um, as, as much as we have admired the Ukrainian population, um, at least you have, there's probably a little bit less enthusiasm there now than there was six months ago or, or a year ago. They're looking at another uh, tough winter. The Russians uh, are focused on, uh, we'll, we'll be launching dozens and dozens of missiles and drones against uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, power grid again this winter. And, and it does uh, it does seem like there's an increasing number of, young, of Ukrainian men, military age males, that are avoiding military service. And I used to really criticize or scoff at the Russians because there are hundreds of thousands of Russian military aged males that were leaving the country to avoid service. And now uh, it does seem like there are reports of Ukrainians that are, that are doing this. And I think this is a, a combination of factors, but the government will have to get that under control because obviously um, they, they need that manpower. But I, I would also say though, Jim, you know, part of this, um, is also, this is why it's so important how governments treat their veterans. Um, if soldiers or family or young, young women and men are considering, thinking about should they join the military or should they find an excuse not to do it or for their parents, if they see how veterans are treated, uh, it will affect um, their decision whether or not to serve. That's true here in the US and, and Europe, other European countries as well. And uh, I think what we're starting, what we should imagine is that given the number of casualties uh, and the number of civilians that have been injured in this conflict, um, the Ukrainians, I hope they don't take five or six years to learn what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. They, we're talking about traumatic brain injury, uh, PTSD, all of these other things where soldiers are surviving horrific explosions that they would not have survived in the past but they're still suffering those uh, invisible wounds, if you will. And, and so uh, I think this is an area where we can help Ukraine um, as they try to model our Veterans Administration or organizations like the Wounded Warrior Project or even Spirit of America and others that are out there that are trying to help deliver uh, health care, both rehabbing physical injury, but also helping with the uh, uh, traumatic um, brain injury. Uh, thank you. And more than half the uh, people on the call on the briefing today, uh, General Hodges, are Spirit of America supporters. So I'll, I'll ask this on uh, their behalf. Uh, you know, you've been very helpful with guidance in terms of what we're doing in Ukraine, uh, both providing specific guidance to people and, and, and projects. And we've talked a lot about what we're doing from the Ukraine Tactical Network to many other areas of support. So uh, could we close with your assessment of the impact of our assistance and, and private assistance and uh, how much of a difference can that make? So uh, I, I see it happening in, in three ways. Number one, there's real uh, tangible help that reaches different parts of Ukrainian armed forces, whether it's you know body armor, boots, uh, the, the uh, vehicles, uh, radios, you know, different things that soldiers use and they get out there they and they augment the actual supply system of the Ukrainian armed forces as well as what the government provides. So there's a an absolute tangible benefit. And I see it on social media all the time, Ukrainians saying, hey, thanks for this. You know, the ex-brigade just received our 
whatever it was. That's that's one uh, very specific thing. Number two, uh, it sends a, a very strong signal to Ukrainians that um, the United States and others are with them. I mean, I think most Ukrainians understand. It's amazing how Europeans understand the American political system so well, and and how I mean, every every person I've talked to at the Ukrainian embassy knows exactly what's going on with the various bills that are you know whether or not you, aid for Ukraine is moving through the through the system. So when they see this kind of support, it lets them know that hey, the United States, the people of the United States, are with them. So that has a very uh, important intangible uh, impact for Ukraine. But then the third thing, it also is a strong signal to our government that when organizations like Spirit of America are able to deliver millions and millions of dollars worth of capability to Ukraine, that, that sends a signal that Americans actually believe that this is important, that, that this is worthwhile, and that uh, the administration and the Congress should not be scared of the electorate not supporting this, that there is actual support for it that the government, uh, I think, should harness. Well, th thank you on that. And uh, just one brief story. The, when I was in Ukraine with our team a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the Ukrainian officers that we met with, uh, who was involved really leading a key program that we're supporting, uh, was wearing a, a, a sweatshirt that had the right words and the right idea on it. It said, never give up. And General, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, they're not going to give up. They they know what uh, they know what's uh, waiting for them if they do give up. So I think, you know, it, it's easy. Uh, the tendency is for us to focus on the Ukrainians and somehow the Russians are unbeatable. They, uh, I think, have so many frailties and so many weaknesses. After nine years of war with every advantage, they still control only about nineteen percent of Ukraine. They have not been able to destroy a single convoy bringing stuff from Poland into Ukraine. And Ukraine has pushed the, the Russian Black Sea fleet out of the Western uh, Black Sea, and Ukraine doesn't even have a navy. So uh, I think uh, Ukraine is going to win this war. They're certainly not going to give up. How long it takes and the cost, I think, depends on us. Well, thank you. And thank you for being with us uh, again today. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining in. Uh, General Hodges, it's an honor to have you as part of our team, and, and uh, uh, good luck with the rest of your trip here in uh, the U.S. Thank you very much, Jim.